I'm Sam Roberts of the New York Times, and welcome to the New York Times Close Up. Today, I'm going to be talking about some remarkable New Yorkers. But first, the midterm races appear to be getting tighter, and New York has become a key battleground from the competitive congressional campaigns to the battle to be governor. And the stars are coming out to help their candidates shine. Former President Bill Clinton made an appearance in Rockland County for Governor Kathy Hochul. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis showed up on Long Island for Lee Zeldin. New York Times political reporters Nicholas Fandos and Michael Gold have been covering the midterm elections, and they both join us now, just days before the election. Nicholas, uh, there are a lot of issues in this campaign when people actually take the time to stop and think about them. Abortion and uh, relation to the Supreme Court decision, crime, inflation, the attack on Nancy Pelosi's husband. Which of those issues do you think is going to dominate the gubernatorial campaign on Tuesday? Well, I think, uh, you know, you're right that all those are going to be in the mix. And for months now, we've seen Democrats kind of picking some of them to talk about and Republicans picking other ones. The Republican issues seem to be winning out or the ones that are more favorable to them. So crime and inflation here in New York seem to be far and away the two issues that voters are telling pollsters are at the top of their mind. Um, and so, you know, we'll see who ends up turning out. It's always a question of turnout. But those seem to be kind of the turf on which the battle's happening here at the, at the end of the race. Can a governor actually do anything about those issues? Well, I think certainly about uh, crime. Inflation's a little bit more difficult. It tends to be more of a, a federal issue. But in terms of crime, I mean, the governor, you know, obviously has access to all sorts of resources that can be used for policing uh, and things like that, and also has a purview over the state's laws. And there's a big argument right now happening, um, not all of it based in the facts, but a big argument happening around uh, bail reform uh, changes that were made by the, the Democrats in 2019 and what effect those have had on uh, public safety in New York. Michael, uh, there are six and a half million Democrats uh, enrolled in New York and about 2.9 million Republicans. So why are Democrats in such a close race? Well, I think there are two things going on. One is turnout is obviously going to be huge in this election. And we see in midterms that people who are most dissatisfied with the status quo tend to be more motivated to vote than people who aren't, especially in a year when you don't have a big presidential race at the top of the ticket. But I think the other thing that's happening here is even though New York has become a solidly Democratic state, no Democrat has won state, I'm sorry, no Republican has won statewide office here in 20 years. The Trump era showed that there is a way to pick away at uh, moderate Democrats who are dissatisfied with their party's emphasis on certain issues and would prefer to see more action being taken on things like crime and, and on things like inflation. Um, and you saw in some voting districts in the city that had voted uh, overwhelmingly for Hillary Clinton in 2016, there was a movement toward the Republican Party in 2020. And I think Republicans saw that in the state and thought there might be a chance to pick up some of those voters using messaging on crime and public safety that many of their candidates used in 2020. Uh, Nicholas, you wrote about uh, Lee Zeldin, the Republican candidate for governor, having to reinvent himself and doing it fairly successfully over the years. Who is he, really? Uh, the, the current Lee Zeldin, is he the real Lee Zeldin? Is he a reinvention? And how uh, is his embrace of Donald Trump going to help or hurt him in New York City? Yeah, well, Lee Zeldin is, you know, originally from Long Island. He's from a, a middle-class family, law enforcement households. Uh, he went into the military at a young age and come out, came out and almost immediately went into politics. And the thing that his track record, his voting record shows very clearly is that he is quite conservative. He opposed gay marriage in New York. He opposes a lot of environmental action. He's for slashing taxes. He's opposed abortion rights. Um, and in Washington, you know, perhaps most consequentially, he embraced Donald Trump in a big way and became one of Trump's biggest allies. He voted on January 6th to throw out election results from the 2020 election. But in this present race, you know, we've seen him downplaying a lot of that, I think. He, he knows where New York voters are. They don't like Trump. They like abortion rights. And he's trying to minimize those positions as he focuses just on crime and public safety. And I think the big test for him is going to be whether voters are willing to overlook uh, a guy who is hostile to abortion rights and, and friendly with Trump, who's frankly reviled in New York by a lot of New Yorkers these days. 
um, and, and are so dissatisfied with the Democrats that they will vote for him anyway. Michael, the debate, there was one debate between Kathy Ockel and Lee Zeldin. Did anything come out of that that was likely to change any minds? I think there were two things that um, might have affected people. Uh, you know, Lee Zeldin really put the emphasis on crime. Um, he kept bringing up bail reform uh, in particular, which, as Nick pointed out, is a controversial issue. And there's a lot of arguments that have been made about whether the bail reform tweaks made in 2019 that uh, limited the ability of judges to set cash bail in some regards, whether that has anything to do with the current crime uptick. Um, and I do want to point out that the governor has already um, allowed for some changes to that law. Mm -hmm. but. It was a big night for Lee Zeldin. He kept pivoting the conversation to his key issue, and I think that's something that might really help him. And we've seen him bring out um, some sound bites from that debate to make the case that he would be tougher on, on crime than the governor. But I think the flip side of this is that uh, at one point, the governor asked Zeldin essentially whether he regretted his vote to decertify um, election results on January 6th. And he essentially stood by what he said. And I think the governor was hoping that that will uh, help a lot of people kind of see the, the vision that she's been trying to uh, outline for the last few months, that, that he represents a fraction of the Republican Party that she's not aligned with and that she thinks doesn't align with New York. The president uh, said on TV the other day that uh, uh, the Republicans represent a threat to democracy, uh, given the Zeldin vote. Uh, most New Yorkers care about that. Our polls seem to suggest that uh, a lot of them care, but they don't care enough about it as an election issue. Yeah, I think that's right. I think there's a core group of, you know, strong Democrats, frankly, and a smaller group of some Republicans that care about it or are very motivated, but it does not seem to be a, a majority or even a plurality of the electorate that is, you know, making choices based on that. And, and Zeldin has tried to, despite what Michael said, which was right about the debate, he's he said, I'll accept the results of this election no matter what happens. He's tried to kind of I think soften some of the edges around his his past stances, and you know, though the governor spent millions and millions of dollars on TV ads hammering him as extreme and too extreme for New York, um, you know, we'll see on election day if any of that is really sticking. Speaking of sticking, Michael, what about surrogates coming into this race? We mentioned before Bill Clinton, Ron DeSantis. Do they make any difference to people vote on the basis of who is endorsing whom? I think when we're this close to an election, having a high-profile figure that can speak for your campaign can really attract attention. I think when a former president comes to campaign for somebody, a lot of people who might not have been plugged in the race uh, might be paying more attention. You know, uh, Governor Hochul has a rally with uh, the vice president, and that also is going to attract a lot of eyeballs to people who might not have been aware of the race. At the same time, uh, it's unclear exactly how how effective it is to have surrogates make the case, especially when they're doubling down on the things that these candidates have been saying for a while. But uh, for the candidates, I think having these people who can help them get headlines is really helpful as, as people are kind of still starting to wake up to the fact that we have an election coming up. Mm. And Nick, you're nodding and agree. Well, I think at this point, it's not about persuasion. It's about getting votes out, and particularly for the Democrats who have this huge voter registration advantage. If, if Democrats vote, they can't lose. Problem is, you know, Democrats don't seem to be all that made it motivated to vote. So maybe Hillary and Bill Clinton and Kamala Harris and uh, and others can help Barack Obama cut a radio ad for Kathy Hochul. I mean, when we're used to Obama going into swing states, not New York. How do you get people to vote? How do you get them motivated? Do you say, oh, the race is closer than it seems? Uh, do you talk about the issues that are so vital? In this election, you see very little evidence that there's a real campaign going on. Yeah, well, I think that that's one of the reasons Democrats are panicking right now is that um, they didn't expect things to get this close, so they were not investing in the kind of on the ground, hand to hand, paper, you know, postering, et cetera, to wake people up. And they're trying to do it at the last minute, I think, with fear, with just outright dragging people to vote. Uh, but it, it's tough to do that after a, a year long campaign. It's hard to build a bunch of momentum right at the at the end. And Zeldin, frankly, has been doing a better job, I think, for the last six months even of, of trying to organically build some of that up. It helps that it's a midterm year, which is you're always going to be backlash at the party in power. So he's got wind at his back. But, um, you know, they were running very different campaigns until recently, and I think that's helped him. And, Michael, you wrote about uh, the Max Rose campaign for Congress, and he's defying the Democratic orthodoxy. What is he doing differently? 
So Max Rose, in many ways, uh, is running the same campaign he ran in 2018. And he's running in a district that is the most conservative district in the city. Staten Island has overwhelmingly bucked the trend of New York City. It's become more conservative compared to a city that's become increasingly liberal. He has not emphasized the party in his race. His, his opponent, Representative uh, Maliotakis, has essentially made this a referendum on Democratic leadership. But Max Rose is really talking about the issues. He's had got a strong ground game, which is what helped him uh, two campaigns ago. He's really trying to build personal connections with voters and say, hey, I'm here to support you on these local issues that you care about. I'm going to vote the way that you would trust me to vote, and I'm not going to do what the party leadership says. And he's hoping that that will help him in a year when so much of campaigning is about the party in power. Do people care about party anymore? I mean, one of the things uh, that we pointed out is 6.5 million Democrats, 2.9 million enrolled Republicans, 3 million unaffiliated uh, voters. I think you can you can ask the question about whether a party affiliation uh, really matters. Essentially, in New York, for the most part, it's qualifying you to vote in a primary election. And I think uh, we've seen from turnout figures that a lot of people aren't doing that. But what has been found over the last few elections is that you used to see a lot more split ticket voting across the country, not just in New York. People now do tend to vote up and down a party line. So it's a challenge for someone like Max Rose, who's trying to set himself um, on kind of an independent course. Congressional races. We started out this year thinking the Democrats were going to sweep the congressional races in New York. They had control over uh, reapportionment gerrymandering. They lost big in the courts. What's going to happen in those races in New York, do you think? Yeah, well, that, that loss in the courts is so important because it's left a very competitive battleground. Um, and right now, I mean, Democrats are, are basically defending five seats that could flip to the Republicans pretty easily and, you know, are struggling, I think, to capitalize on their pickup opportunities. So I think a dream night for the Democrats would be breaking even in New York. Uh, but realistically, I mean, I think we could see seats, one or two seats on in Nassau County, uh, two, maybe three seats in the Hudson Valley and going down into Westchester, potentially flip to the Republicans. And that includes, notably, Sean Patrick Maloney, who's the chairman of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. So he's in charge of protecting their majority nationally. And he himself, you know, is really on the ropes. Why frankly, is that? Why, why are the Democrats in so much trouble in congressional races in New York in particular? Yeah, well, I think it, it's two answers. It, it goes back to the gerrymandering issue. I mean, most of the country moved in one direction this year towards less competitive direct districts. New York actually moved towards more competitive districts. So they're going to be more susceptible to actually how voters feel, which is probably a good small-D Democratic thing. But in an environment where the issues seem to be helping Republicans quite a bit, Maloney's race, for instance, looks a lot like the national one. Mm. Um, he's defending himself on crime and just getting hammered on, on inflation and, and public safety by his Republican opponent. Um, so we'll see. I mean, there are actually two really good campaigners in that race. It's a fun one to watch. We'll, we'll see what happens. Michael, a quick last question. Money, is that a big factor in the gubernatorial campaign? Money is a factor and not a factor. I think going into where we are now, the governor had a huge fundraising advantage. But... Um, Congressman Zeldin has really been able to make the most of his opportunities, and he's attracted a lot of attention from outside Republicans who really want to see if he can flip New York, which has been so solidly blue, into a red state. So we'll see you on Tuesday night. Yes. Thanks to New York Times political reporters Nicholas Fandos and Michael Gold for joining us. Next, we'll turn the tables. I'm going to be interviewed on a new book I've written about some remarkable New Yorkers. Welcome back to the New York Times Close Up. I've written a new book called The New Yorkers, 31 Remarkable People, 400 Years, and the Untold Biography of the World's Greatest City. I've asked my next guest, Eleanor Randolph, to interview me about the book, as I did for her biography, The Many Lives of Michael Bloomberg. Eleanor, of course, a former member of the New York Times editorial board. Eleanor, fire away. Uh, you know, uh, I get to ask really tough questions. I hope so. Okay. So you said, uh, you said in your book that since 1790, there have been 923 million New Yorkers. And you picked 31. Why? Well, uh, first of all, because I can't count very well. <laughs> I did a book, uh, History of New York in 27 Buildings, 
and I really was supposed to do 25, and I miscounted. <laughs> 31, obviously, uh, New Yorkers in this book, an arbitrary number. Uh, a demographer said that if you count everyone who ever might have lived in New York since the first census in 1790, there could have been as many as a billion people. I picked an arbitrary figure of 31 because I just ran out of space. I could only fit so many words. But what I found was there were so many remarkable people. My criteria in picking these people were they had to be dead because I thought people in the late 20th century, it was too soon to judge how important they might have been. Uh, they had to be quirky. They had to be kind of interesting and either transformative or representative of some sort of transformation. And for the most part, they had to be unknown, mm -hmm. not the kind of people you would read about in a history book, in a guidebook, people to a great extent who I, as a New Yorker, had never heard of. And I thought that even most people familiar with New York history had never heard of. And there are a couple of names in there you might know, uh, but I think you'd know them for different reasons than for the reason they're in the book. Well, you know, um, there are a lot of different kinds of characters, and I, I'd, I'd like to really ask you, ask you who your favorites are, are. But, you know, is it the the woman, the first uh, nude in a in a motion picture? Is it the woman who um, who was the early Rosa Parks? Is it? Uh, and I just I have to ask you about James Gordon Bennett, who who started the Herald, the New York Herald, because um, uh, my husband is British, and he says in Britain the phrase Gordon Bennett is a slur. So it would be like people uh, now saying, you know. Rupert Murdoch or something. Or Donald slur, Trump. Or, or Donald Trump. Well, it's funny because uh, you picked three of my favorites. Audrey Munson is the model, the sculptor's model. If you look all over New York City without knowing it, you will see her face, uh, the Pulitzer Fountain, the main monument in Central Park. Her body, too. And body. Uh, if you look up at the very top of the municipal building, she is the face of civic fame. And she was a model. She, as you say, was the first uh, person to pose nude in a motion picture, three of them, in fact. She was involved in a murder case. She attempted suicide. She was in a uh, mental institution. She died in the uh, 1990s at the age of 104. She never got an obituary in the New York Times like many of the people in this book. And what better model for Miss Manhattan, which she was as a monument, than someone who fit all of those criteria. I just thought that was fascinating and perfectly fitting with the image of New York. Uh, Elizabeth Jennings, uh, who was a black woman, a school teacher, she was late uh, for playing the organ one Sunday morning at a church on the Lower East Side. She hailed the Third Avenue trolley. The conductor threw her off because she was black and this was a whites only trolley. She sued. And she hired a young lawyer named Chester Arthur, who mm -hmm. later became the president of the United States. In Brooklyn Supreme Court, she won. The judge said, you can't keep this person off a trolley. She's respectable. She's well-dressed. You can't deny her public transportation just because she's black. This was 1854, 100 years before Rosa Parks. And nobody knew her. Nobody remembered her. She got no recognition until a couple of uh, elementary school students petitioned their city councilwoman and got a street corner named after her. And James Gordon Bennett, uh, Charles Krauthammer said of Rupert Murdoch that he discovered a niche in American broadcasting, half the American public. Well, that's what James Gordon Bennett did when he uh, started the New York Herald. He made this penny paper uh, a vital institution in American journalism. You might not have liked it. You might not have uh, liked what he said, what he did, but you read it. And uh, as your husband said, James Gordon Bennett was such an outrageous, audacious character that just saying Gordon Bennett uh, was enough of a slur, enough of a uh, representative uh, representation of audacity that people knew exactly what you were talking about. 
So um, there's, I, I, I don't know how to pick um, all of the ones I liked because uh, there are so many of them, but tell us about Charles Dowd. Oh, another one of my favorites. When uh, in the 1800s, the mid 1800s, when you looked up at the sky and the sun was in the middle of the sky, that was noon wherever you were. And that could be very, very confusing if, among other things, you were taking a train because the timetables were based on noon in every city in the country. Noon was different. If it was noon in New York, it could be 11.57 in Newark. It could be 11.10 in Chicago. And this wasn't very good if you were trying to avoid train crashes, if you were trying to make a train on a timetable. Charles Dowd was a philosophy professor at upstate New York, and he said in uh, about 1869, we need to have time zones. And he became the father of standard time, of four zones. It wasn't until 1883 that the railroads adopted four zones of standard time. The government had nothing to do with this. It was the railroads that did it. It first happened at Grand Central Terminal, Grand Central Depot at the time in New York City. Uh, and, you know, these things are stranger than fiction. In 1903, Charles Dowd, who was the father of Standard Time, dies by getting run over by a train. Uh, you know, what, as I say, you can't make these things up. And to add insult to injury, they memorialized Charles Dowd by building a sundial in his honor. I mean, instead of doing anything like, you know, a timetable, a clock, there's a sundial, the father of Standard Time, that replaced you know, using the sun as the measure of what time is it. You know, it's fascinating. <laughs> um, go back a little bit and talk about, <clears throat> I mean, one of the things that you describe is how New York City was, um, there were just pigs everywhere, all over New York City. Talk about how that changed for the city. Well, it was fascinating because when you think of, of how New York was viewed, by Europeans at the time in the early, the mid 19th century, they thought of pigs. There were pigs roaming the street all over the place. And one pig owner sued the city and said, you can't tell us you know, where to keep our pigs. These are a source <laughs> of livelihood, a source of, uh, of food uh, for many poor people as well as uh, entrepreneurs. And he lost the suit and it enabled the city to exercise a certain police power over, you know, what was an agrarian economy in New York City. And that, you know, really helped define the city's authority over all sorts of uh, lawlessness that was going on. Now you have to keep pigs on a leash. I think. You have to keep them on a leash, exactly. <laughs> um, so talk to us a little bit about Andrew H. Green and Appendix H. Appendix H. It was in a report he wrote for the City Parks Commission. Andrew Green was the father of Greater New York. You can find a bench named after him in City uh, in Central Park. You can now find a little park that is growing on uh, the Upper East Side of Manhattan. But Andrew Green was the man who was responsible for bringing all five boroughs together. It's still called in certain quarters Brooklyn's greatest mistake, but, but he was the man who did that. And what happened to Andrew H. Green? He was murdered on Park Avenue in 1903 in what was a case of mistaken identity in a love triangle case. I mean, again, you couldn't dream these things up if you went out and tried to fictionalize this story of New York. And that's why I did this, because I've written books about material culture in New York, 12, New York at 101 12. objects, New York at 27 buildings. And, you know, I wanted to do a biography of New York, and that's what uh, this book is. So let me thank you for interviewing me, New York Times contributing writer Eleanor Randolph. And coming up next, I'll have some thoughts on public service in New York. We New Yorkers typically boo our mayors. We whine about our civil servants. 
This week, I was lucky enough to write about one who deserved our thanks. His name was Bernie Rosen. Unfortunately, Bernie didn't get to read it. The article I wrote for The Times was his obituary. That's a reminder for us to express our appreciation to people while they're still alive. There wasn't a budget director in the last 50 years who didn't rely on Bernie, said Joe Loda, who was budget director and deputy mayor under Rudy Giuliani. Rosen worked for the city for nearly 36 years, 28 of them with the Office of Management and Budget, where he was the deputy director. He was the office's institutional memory. He knew which taxes yielded how much and which budget cuts would inflict the least pain. What was Bernie's pivotal role? Mayor Koch once summed it up to Abe Lackman, who was Giuliani's first budget director. Lackman recalled Koch saying, quote, you're going to come to the end of the budget process and you'll be $100 million short. And you'll go to Bernie and say, OK, Bernie, where is it? And he'll find it. So I got to that last week, Lackman continued, and I was 200 million short. And I said to Bernie that Koch had said, you could always find 200 million. Never 200 million, only 100 million, Bernie told me. I had to cut 100 million, Lackman said, and Bernie found the other 100. But Bernie would always keep that kind of information away from budget directors until the last minute, Lackman added. If we saw it too soon, we'd spend it. For The New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Sam Roberts.